This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. Welcome to Ramdas Here and Now. I'm Raghu Marcus. Uh, my, I'm, I've, we've got a, a pretty great uh, talk that I found of Ram Dass's called uh, Bringing It All Back Home. But before I get into that, uh, I came across something uh, pretty interesting. I hope it's interesting to everybody. Uh, it is, well, my father passed a number of months ago, earlier this year, and uh, we had a memorial for him. And a lot of uh, satsang was there, as well as family, because my father was, as many of you know, because I've told this story through podcasts and on retreats and so on, my father ended up in India to to see how my brother and I were doing when we went there, uh, when Ramdas went back the second time, and we were there, a bunch of us, and uh, his wife gave my stepmother gave me uh, a bunch of uh, his possessions and in them was he kept a a whole raft of letters that I and my brother had written him uh, from India uh, before he came that first time and I think we had you know letters back and forth after he came back and so on so I had not even seen these things over these many, many years. And uh, I just started going through them uh, before I was going to do this podcast. And I thought, geez, I, this is unbelievable because I wrote him a letter just after I met Maharaji, literally the day after or within days. So... This gives you an idea. Here I was, 24, 25 years old, just in India for a number of months. I made it up north to Nainital and had darshan with Ramdas's guru immediately. His name is Neem Karoli Baba, and he is obviously what was shining through Ramdas in America and what is shining through him now. As with the mother, and I was referring to the mother at Sri Aurobindo Ashram, who I had, a saint that I, it was the first holy being that I had met in my trip to India, and, and I had been there just before I had seen Maharaji. As with the mother, he emits the most pure, loving, beautiful vibrations. I, along with some other Ramdas followers, were in, the pre- were in his presence for three days. He constantly gave out with facts about our past and our future. It's quite unbelievable to sit with a being who knows the past, present, and future. I felt like pinching myself to see if I was really there. I kept thinking, what else could I experience in India? But it seems endless. There was a friend of mine from Canada in this group. And when we first came to see him, without saying anything, he said, in other words, I didn't say, this was the first words, he just turned to me and to her, and he went, you're friends from Canada, in a sort of off-the-cuff statement. He he then told me I had been at Aurobindo Ashram before coming there, which is where the mother was. Actually, Those are trivial things compared to his actual presence. That would be impossible to describe in words. All that Ramdas said of him is more than true. That's just the first part of this. I, you know, fascinating to me to read back then and, uh, and remember those moments. I remember those moments, uh, as if they were yesterday. Uh, maybe I'll read some more as we go along uh, with these podcasts. I haven't read them myself, so I need to... Uh, I'll, I'll pick some of them out. They're, it's pretty interesting stuff, actually. Uh, so, bringing it all back home. Ram Dass, uh gave a talk. This is uh, probably in the early 90s, and I think it was at Omega. 
and it's it's around what we build a habitual a habitual structure of self definition right and it's a habitual self definition of separateness and this you know is what we have in front of us to deconstruct through spiritual practices, awareness, witness, all the stuff that Ram Dass has talked so much about over so many years. And it's what does it take to bring about full transformation so that you dance in your separateness uh, without being entrapped by it? And that is so much of our day-to-day uh, anxiety is is to find that kind of balance. Um, and here, and he goes on to talk about all of the spiritual practices move you in the direction of becoming familiar and at home, which is what, in what is called the domain of the spirit, which includes everything, but is seen from a different vantage point. That to me is one of the most crucial aspects of, uh, of tr- uh, treading upon the spiritual path. It is, and, and you know, Ramdas has talked about this from its earliest days through the middle part of his teaching career to the to where he is now, where he talks so much about um, getting into the spiritual heart and loving awareness and getting out of the mind ego and just moving your vantage point from there, from the mind to the heart. And uh, that, that switch, when it starts to happen, you, your, your, your awareness, uh, it just jumps, uh, you know, it's not like awareness doesn't jump up a level, which is what I was going to say, but it becomes more vast. And in that vastness, there's less judgment, there's less guilt, there's less attachment to thoughts and following them, there's less uh, wallowing in disturbing emotions. So, uh, you know, certainly uh, when we talk about a vantage point change, I mean, and this is so crucial to walking the path, uh, what else? It, let it come to pass that the forgetting is the remembering. That's a great little line. That it's just like, that's what the thing is about. Um, when, when he talks back here about um, moving you in the direction of becoming familiar and at home. So when you become more familiar and at home with the the realm of spirituality of identifying yourself more with your heart i mean more simply said that way so that whenever you realize that you are forgetting or you're getting lost you can use that as your remembering so in other words put a positive spin on it we can put that positive spin on it um when you get lost in your drama, the, the image of forgetting is great because it reminds you. So that, just having that viewpoint is now seeing uh, your life from a completely different vantage point. Um, here's something, and uh, as, as he went along and, and talked, um, it's interesting because what is this? Uh, well, it's 20 odd years ago. The world is going to get more and more unstable. So there is tremendous value in seeing the possibility that one can ride the waves of change without being wiped out by them. And Boy, are we ever in unstable times these days, in every which way, from the environment to to the intersectarian wars that are taking place, to the division of of, uh, wealth uh, in this country, for sure. So even more fodder for 
getting uh, into the idea that we can see all of this from a different vantage point. I think that's such a great uh, a term. Uh, and, and being able to do so will allow us to, to ride through these changes that are going on and be able to transform ourselves inside so that we not only can be more balanced, but we can offer something to our fellow humans uh, to, to make the changes that are going to be necessary for us to um, make this a more better place to live. At the end of this uh, talk is uh, Ramdas uh, and somebody else does a couple of quotations from uh, different people. And Ramdas's quotation was from Swami Vivekananda. And Swami Vivekananda was one of the was the, I believe, chief disciple of uh, Ramakrishna, the great saint who lived in Dakshineshwar, which is near. Calcutta, and um, he was a, a, a great devotee of mother, the mother, the goddess, Kali, and uh, he, uh, this quote, I had never heard it before, and it's from some letter that Vivekananda was writing to uh, an American friend devotee, I think it was American, certainly a Westerner, uh, Boy, this this uh, little quote is worth the price of admission. It's just fabulous. So, um, a great talk, and uh, uh, let's uh, get into it and and listen to it. Uh, before I um, turn it over to Ramdas, so to speak, I want to just remind everybody that Ramdas's new book called Polishing the Mirror, which was written with Rameshwar Das, uh, who co uh, worked with him and co-wrote um, Be Love Now, Ram Das's book of a few, new book of a few years ago, latest book. So, uh, Polishing the Mirror, coming out uh, August 1, uh, which will be right after you hear this podcast, I believe. And uh, it's a wonderful book that is... A really a um, a manual, a guide, how to be here now. So everything that he was talking about in this particular lecture about moving your vantage point um, to the spiritual plane, from the mind to the heart, all of that is got. Uh, this book has absolute practical instructions uh, through his wonderful sense of humor, Ramdas's sense of humor and storytelling to uh, allow this uh, to to for make it easily absorbable is that a word anyhow here we go ramdas here and now bringing it all back home this week you i suspect saw the liquidity of time how moments felt like hours and at times hours felt like moments and six and a half days past it's as if you and I are learning how to swim and we keep coming back to land to touch down to be with the familiar limits of our the earth on which we're familiar with walking And we're still developing our dolphin-esque qualities. Our ability to be at home in the water of the great perfection, the pure awareness. It's interesting that it's... When, when you have built such a habitual structure of self-definition on this plane of reality, on Earth, to awaken to the realization that it's beautiful being just what it is, and that there are places you can see it from 
that turn it from being a kind of a burdensome weight to being a delightful play. That at first the journey starts where you are on the normal waking consciousness plane and you touch, you come into a kind of spacious awareness that's quiet and clear and you see it all and you're, there's no doing, there's no coming, there's no going, there's just... Oh. And then something causes you to grab or fixate and you're suddenly in familiar territory back in the model of your separateness and you say I got high and I came down and that's a model you impose from your habitual self-definition of separateness so what does it take to bring about the full transformation so that you don't come back to that you don't reject it you dance in your separateness without being entrapped by it how can you transform where you stand or don't stand so that you there is no home to come to it's all just the play of form All of the spiritual practices move you in the direction of becoming familiar and at home in what is often called the domain of the spirit, which includes all of this, but seen from a slightly different point of view. And as you've noticed this week, while you've all been extraordinarily open to the variety of practices that have been offered, you can feel that you have, because of where you're starting from, your karmic predicament, a proclivity, an attraction towards one form more than another. For some of you, the kind of metaphysical reflection, thinking about the nature of self, or things like that, right on just excites you immensely and keeps taking you to the edge somebody else singing Om Namah Shivaya brings you into through the softness of the heart into a that quality of spacious moment presence For another person, the exploring the ways in which you are um, attached to thought, feeling, role, model, the kind of cathartic experience of sharing image of self with each other. the grieving and acknowledging and being with the stuff of life has allowed you to relax, release, open. For still others, just the meditative opening into spacious awareness simply given through the relaxed state of being is what touched you most deeply what we come away from is hearing our own unique journey 
respecting the uniqueness of others and their journeys. And be, being careful not to get too enamored of even your path, but rather become free. How many moments when you quote, leave Omega or whoever that is that thinks they're doing that. How many moments in the journey between what you think is here and what you think is there, will there be moments? A moment, a pet, a moment of ah, a moment of, of appreciating a tree, a flower, a moment, a predicament, the poignancy, the humor, the flow, the emptiness, the sweetness, the fullness. How many moments? How much will one get identified with thought of planning? How will my life change? The best practice to be free is to be free. That's the practice, is to just, oh. If per some strange chance, you should happen to get lost into your drama sometime in the future again. <laughs> Don't. That image that forgetting is great because it's such fun to remember. And let it come to pass that the forgetting is the remembering. Uspensky, who was a student of Gordiev, used to describe how he would go walking and he would try to be mindful and he would keep witnessing his own behavior and he'd say, Uspensky is walking down the street. Uspensky is turning left. Uspensky is noticing the sweetness of the weather. And he was just so mindful until he saw his tobacconist's shop and he remembered he needed pipe tobacco. Two days later, he remembered he had been doing an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at first you go under and it seems so real again and you forget you ever knew that it wasn't real and the moments you tasted freedom seem like dreams And then as time goes on, it gets so that you're more comfortable remaining in a more spacious way of being in the universe that allows more planes of reality to simultaneously exist. And you arrive, you're so rooted in the quality of being, in, the, in just presence, 
that as your awareness starts to be drawn out into phenomena and you start to grab the thickness of coming into that density of relationship with form and being in a finite form somebody doing something, wanting something, thinking something, planning something, remembering something that thickness itself awakens you it's as if you dive from air into water and as the thickness of the water you feel that resistance it awakens you of oh and you come back out it's what the beads do you're you're roaming your way along so spacious and then another car cuts you off <laughs> and you are full of righteous indignation and you're doing the beads ferociously but there's no rom that's just god damn bastard he shouldn't have done that what kind of a thing is that son of a bitch and you're going you know and then at some moment that pressure on the finger there's a little bit of reminder and there's a a kind of a weak rum that sneaks up through the anger and righteous indignation and slowly the method works and you come back into wow that was like a summer storm Whew. boy didn't that anger seem real it's just hard to conceive how in the midst of all of the of what is the suffering the pain the hope and the hopelessness the uncertainty the decay the corruption the regeneration in in the thickness of all of it what one can be not rejecting anything embracing it all into a spacious presence in which there is delight in the universe and a quality of um, um, rootedness or quietness and an embracing of everything as one thing that out of that comes the compassionate next moment out of it arises an action many of us are afraid that if we get too free of our indignation or our upset about the condition of things we won't do what's necessary to write it but there's another place to play from newspaper clipping out of the tragedy and misery of the devastating cyclone in Bangladesh came the story of a breathtaking rescue of a child Abdullah al Haman told reporters that a dolphin took hold of the baby who had been swept out to sea at the village of Yukia by a tidal wave during the height of the April 29th cyclone the baby was delivered back to shore 18 miles from Yukia where people took the child from the dolphin's mouth took it to a district hospital where the infant was said to be well do you think the dolphin what do you think the dolphin thought <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
He just wanted to get his name in the papers, probably. <laughs> That's what his mother told him to do when, yes, from an early age. <laughs> <laughs> he could be the best dolphin. there are there are moments when because you're among satsang or you're the sangha or you're in a spacious safe place or there's time free time you can very easily find your way into your deeper truths, truth of your being. And there are other times when it will appear to you that the universe is so um, repulsive or attractive, fascinating, that you will feel yourself you feel yourself you'll feel somebody getting caught in something it's interesting to know on the journey what your limits are and to define the boundaries that you need while you need boundaries. Ultimately you will need no boundaries and maybe the ultimate is now. But there are certain relationships that you will enter into in which that mindfulness and awareness and spaciousness that we have cultivated this week and the kind of devotional love of the beauty of the manifestation of another being will be hard tried by the power of the other person's mind and the power of the ways in which your mutual needs interact and then it'll become very thick and you either will have enough cultivation of space to be able to be mindful at that moment and to transform that into something much more spacious and more truthful and more open and more free or you won't and I feel no blame towards myself any longer for those situations that are too strong for me to transform. It seems perfectly okay for me to say, this one I can't work with just now. I'll work with it another day. I don't think you have to push against yourself that way. I think there is a, an emerging awareness and mindfulness and joy and delight that consumes into itself things if you'll just give it space to time to do it if you'll be patient and when something's a little too heavy you may have to stay in it in which then it is a fire of purification trauma is a very profound vehicle for awakening when you are put in a situation where you are invited to bear what is unbearable and what happens is like the loss of somebody you love and you realize that who you think you are can't bear it 
and it forces a connection to the deeper part of being where all is and it's all bearable even what isn't bearable Sometime the saints, the beings who have become enlightened are called the living dead. And that has something to do with the fact that the limits of being somebody and thinking they are somebody have died. And the person who says, this is unbearable, I can't stand this, isn't there anymore. And they can look just at what is in the universe, including the breaking of the heart over and over and over again. To be able to contain in your being the immensity of the pain, the immensity of the beauty, and to rest with all of that so in your being that your actions reflect a wisdom that comes from emerging with it all so that the the child in Africa or the person that's mentally disturbed or the person that is frightened or it's all in here Truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. The longing for peace, the longing for people to be other than they are, prevents you from seeing what is. To see what is includes your longing for peace includes your wishing that people would be more kind to one another. Includes the actions of your own heart. But don't be afraid to set boundaries. As the Marines say, what you can change, change, and what you can't, paint. <laughs> I love that. That's the second time this week. <laughs> To look at life, as Emmanuel has suggested, as a curriculum and look at the predicament you find yourself in just the way it is, just, just the way it is. Not with if only, but just the way, including the if only. That part of you that says, I could really, if only, if only, if only. Include that too.
just look at the way in which the manifestation is occurring on earth that's called, you call me. Look at it as an exquisitely articulated, evolving statement of the divine awakening to its divinity. Hmm. The world is going to get more and more unstable in world level stuff. Economically, politically, socially, ecologically. And what this week is about is seeing the possibility that one can ride the waves of change without being wiped out by them. I was sitting, I live in San Francisco, I was sitting in an earthquake recently, which <laughs> in San Francisco that's not unusual, and I was, I was sitting in an earthquake recently and things were flying off the shelf and doors were flying open. Yeah. And I didn't know whether the, the land would open up and me and the house and all of it would be a memory. And I remember thinking, ah, 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 so here we go. It's the girl in the village that has a love affair with a fisherman and she becomes pregnant and she doesn't want to admit it was a fisherman so she says it was the monk up in the monastery. <laughs> so when the baby's born they take the villagers take the baby to the monastery and they knock at the gate and the monk opens the gate and they say here's a baby you are the sire of it you raise it. And the monk said, Ah, so. <laughs> and he took the baby and closed the gate. Some years later. I am the monk. So, some years later. Just stick to your lines. Stick to your lines. I actually think he's I, the fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's only one person in the story anyway so some years later the girl was dying and she didn't want to die without confessing that it was the it was not the monk it was the fisherman which she did and the townspeople really realized they had made a mistake and so they went up and they knocked at the gate and the gate was opened and there stood the monk with the child who is now nine years old, ten years old. And the people said, we really made a mistake and it is not your responsibility to raise the child and now we will be happy to take care of the child. And the monk said, Ah, uh, so... <laughs> So I invite you, if you're looking for a mantra, try that one. Ah, so. Ah, so. Your check just bounced. Ah, so. Transmission fell out of your car. Ah, so. Ah, so. Try the little ones first. Before you get to, ah, dying of a terrible disease, ah, so. See, you don't laugh, do you? See? Gotcha. Gotcha where you live, see? see? I'll wait. 
Dying is no laughing matter. Huh. Maybe a cosmic giggle or two, but that's all. Hmm. It's such an adventure to keep, to remember and to forget and to remember more and to just play with the naturalness of it all and realize after years and years of pushing and ought and should and how much of a failure you are and you're not high enough and all of that, to start to just appreciate just the way it is. For for those of you that really appreciate touching the qualities of the compassion of your heart, but find that the circumstances tend to make you protect your heart, I encourage you to just look around where you are and listen and find a way in which you can reach out to be there for someone else. That the practice of kindness, of compassionate action, is something that draws you out of yourself. I find that because of what I have projected out, people will come to me and present something extremely pressing and profound and deep, quickly, like the loss of a child or something like that. And I can be standing there filled with my own self stuff, inadequacy, arrogance, insecurity, studying, planning, whatever it is, and I find that the realness of their demand on my heart demands that I let go. It pulls me out of myself. And I think that the opportunity to be with children in a way that is reaching out, to be with elders, to be with the sick, to be with people in any way disadvantaged, to be with people, just it pulls you out of yourself. It pulls you into yourself. It pulls you into the deeper truth of your being. Because at that point, what can you offer that other person other than the purest thing you have to offer? How could you offer any less? How could you do it? I mean, for me, being in the Seva Foundation, for example, because of the nature of what a foundation that is there to try to relieve a little suffering is like, you become much more aware of the massive nature of suffering. And the reactions to that, at first, it's so overwhelming, you want to hide. You want to go into denial again. And then you keep with your whole hands with each other and you get so that you can stay open facing the inability of you to take away all suffering. Most people are afraid that if they look at what is, they will break. It'll be too much for you. And I would say it is too much for who you think you are. It is not too much for who you are. And so I invite you to to open to the suffering of the universe, knowing that you can only do what you can do.
and that if you do what you can do, but only with a sense of frustration because you can't do more, what you are transmitting with the very thing you are doing is that frustration. While if you're quiet, you see the web of suffering in the universe, you see yourself, you see all the others, you see the web of compassion in the universe. I mean, I get, I'm on the good guy mailing list just like you, and there are hundreds and hundreds of requests for help. And I go through them, and there's no rational way I can decide. No way I can do that. I just feel my way through, and one of them pulls, and one of them doesn't. But I know that that one pulled for me and that one pulled for someone else. And that we are part of the family of compassion. And I let my responses change from year to year. People say, your membership is up. <laughs> oh my God, no, I'm... I'm bad. Eh? <laughs> I wish it were. <laughs> uh, 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 let yourself just be alive to the moment. Just one more thought is is the the nature and power of community. That because of the myths of the culture, many of us have found ourselves free to be alone. And that we have experienced the alienation from others, the cut-offness from others. Instead of the great aloneness, we felt lonely. There are many ways to be alone, many ways. But on the plane of form, however real or unreal that is, we are interdependent. And to embrace a myth that acts as if we aren't is dysfunctional. It's dysfunctional. And we are living in a society that has dysfunctional myths. And you and I have been sucked in by them and we've even fed them. Most of what People magazine represents, for example, is the myth of the individual, the famous individual, the somebody, the somebodies. But how many important somebodies do I know and how much pain are they all in? It's as if we sacrifice beings into our worship of somebodiness. And if you watch the presidents, we give them the power like sacrificial animals. It's like in the old days when they would, they'd make a maiden the queen for a year and then cut her heart out. We do it to presidents. You watch them, they turn all kind of weird, you know. <laughs> they like, it's like the, they are the picture of Dorian Gray. <laughs> So I invite you to examine the myths you live with. And when you see that there is part of the web that has been broken that you are part of with earth, so that it feels strange to go out and sit on the grass and touch the earth, or be with a tree, or enjoy the rain, or walk in the desert, or by the ocean. When it's starting to feel alien to you, Feel your way in. Maybe there's a little something to do there to reestablish your part of the web. 
when you're scared of the woods, when you're afraid, afraid, afraid of the universe, afraid. It, huh. It's the one of transforming the thems into the us's, into feeling it's all family. Each of us has a quotation to share with you. Let's see who could start. Do you want to create a meditative space? We don't have to, oh, okay. you don't have to come up to the you just hear the mic. Who wants to start? This is from the Bhagavad Gita. All that exists is woven on me like a web of pearls on thread. I am the taste in water, Arjuna, the light in the moon and sun, Om, resonant in all sacred lore, the sound in space, valor in men and women. I am the pure fragrance in earth, the brilliance in fire, the life in all living creatures, the penance in ascetics. Know me, Arjuna, as every creature's timeless seed, the understanding of intelligent men and women, the brilliance of fiery heroes. Of the strong I am strength, without the emotion of desire, in creatures, I am the desire that does not impede sacred duty. Know that nature's qualities come from me. Lucidity, passion, and dark inertia. I am not in them, they are in me. All this universe, diluted by the qualities inherent in nature, fails to know that I am beyond them and unchanging. This is from a 10th century teacher named Yun Men. Let me take the whole universe and put it on the tips of your eyelashes. Don't be impatient when you hear this, but slowly and carefully examine it. If you are a good student, you won't rest until you have realized it then you will be a superior person. 
When you hear that some great master has appeared in the world to liberate all beings, you'll immediately clap your hands over your ears. As long as you aren't your own master, you may think you have gained something from what you hear, but it is second-hand merchandise and not yours. Look at Taishan. The moment he saw a monk coming, he would chase him off with his stick. <laughs> or Mu Chu. Whenever a monk entered his room, he would say, you deserve to be hit 30 times. <laughs> what can other teachers do? If they don't know for themselves, they are just swallowing other people's saliva. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, those who really have it, live like ordinary men. Those who don't have it should use their time. Be very careful. Among the ancient masters, there are quite a few who left helpful teachings. Shui Feng, for example, said, The whole earth is nothing but you. Chia Shan said, Find me on the tips of a hundred blades of grass and recognize the king in a crowded market. Lo Pu said, When you hold a grain of dust, you are holding the universe in your hand. A golden lion in all its splendor is you. Take these teachings and meditate on them again and again. Someday you will find your entrance. This is a letter that Swami Vivekananda wrote to Miss Josephine McLeod in April of 1900. This was a few years before he died. and He died at a, in his 30s, his late 30s. Vivekananda was a, um, a very deep disciple of Swami of Ramakrishna. And Vivekananda took the teachings out into the world and brought them to America and played a key role in opening up, bringing Eastern spiritual ideas into the West in the 1890s. And he called Josephine Joe and he said, after all, Joe, I am only a boy who used to listen with rapt wonderment to the wonderful words of Ramakrishna under the banyan tree at Dakshineshwar. That is my true nature. Doing good and so forth are all superimpositions. Now I again hear the voice, the same old voice thrilling my soul. Bonds are breaking, love dying, work becoming tasteless. The glamour is off life. Yes, I come. Nirvana is before me. I feel it at times, the same infinite ocean of peace, without a ripple, a breath. Since the beginning of this year, I have not dictated anything in India, you know that. I am drifting again in the warm heart of the river. 
I dare not make a splash with my hands or feet for fear of breaking the wonderful stillness that makes one feel sure the world is an illusion. Behind my work was ambition. Behind my love was personality. Behind my purity was fear. Behind my guidance was thirst for power. Now they are vanishing and I drift. I come, mother, a spectator, no more an actor. Things are seen and felt like shadows. This podcast has been brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate all the support for the Foundation and for Ramdas' work, and we hope that you will continue that support. You can go to Ramdas.org and click on the Donate Now button and follow the prompts. Thank you.